here today to meet the um, Tibetan community in Madison, Wisconsin. And over the past decade, I have had the pleasure of meeting and bringing the book Voices from Tibet to the Tibetan community all over North America and Europe, including the communities in Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Toronto, New York, um, let me think. In Europe, uh, the communities in Zurich, um, in Amsterdam, London, um, as well as supporters uh, in different parts of the world. Last year, I went to Vilnius, uh, where the Lithuanians, uh, um, all, uh, your community knows that they are very supportive of Tibetans and the fight. Um, because they told me in 1990, when they are fighting, when the Lithuanians are fighting for the independence, they received a telegram from the Dalai Lama, who, uh, who is among the first world leaders to support their fight uh, in a non-violent way. So therefore, now they are very supportive of the Tibetans. And then I also went on to Copenhagen, where there's also a, a small Tibetan community, but a lot of supporters. And then this year, I am here and hoping, uh, planning to go to Prague, uh, where they, uh, the supporters there will be hosting a Tibet Literature Week in November. And then also hoping to go to Berlin on the same trip. And I've been with, um, like, have been in contact with the leaders there um, of uh, Tibet Initiative Deutschland. journalist and a writer and thank you so much for taking the time taking the trouble and come and talk to our students uh, so yeah so Violet Law uh, she uh, she has this book uh, edited and translated uh, this book is about uh, Wesela and Wang Lijong uh, uh, her husband and uh, so if please if you would like to check out uh, this book we have a table set up here on the right side uh if you would like to buy the book uh, we have a table set up on the right side and uh, if you can like uh, you know maybe i guess uh, during the um, talk but you know, just slowly, quietly, you can check out, uh, but not in a group. <laughs> so yeah, with that, uh, without any further ado, uh, please uh, welcome uh, Walid Law. <laughs> any students, and uh, this is an open event for the public as well, so there are uh, quite a few number of uh, parents and the uh, public uh, attending this talk as well. So students, please uh, prepare your questions at the end of the talk. 
Okay, so this if, uh, talk is, uh, we have about like uh, more or less an hour, so we have to wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, well, this is my first time in Madison, and I'm so excited. I came up from Chicago, not that far away, but I think there's a bigger community here than in that than what I've seen in Chicago. Uh, my name is Violet, and I am a writer, and more importantly, a translator. What does that mean? Meaning I am able to um, um, basically um, read one language and then put it into English um, so that uh, more people can read what is being written. And what I've translated is the writings by this lady here, uh, Bose. And uh, she is a very famous writer, uh, Tibetan writer. In like, she's well known all over the world. But then you might wonder how come, like she, um, the fact is uh, she has to write in Chinese, but not Tibetan. And well, it's in a way it's lucky for me because. Tibetan is not an easy language. I'm sure all of you guys know, and I don't read it, but then I uh, can read Chinese, and she writes in Chinese, so I have been able to translate her work. But then you might wonder, how come she cannot, she wouldn't write in Tibetan? Well, here I have to say, you guys are so lucky, because you are here every Sunday to learn to write uh, in Tibetan, but then Wose did not have that opportunity, and I'm here to tell you why. Um, when she was 15, it was in the 1980s, um, Wose is one of the smartest students um, living in Lhasa, and then at the time, the Chinese government decided that, oh, we'll, uh, we'll find the smartest kids in Tibet, and we'll, um, we'll do something. And what they were trying to do is to uh, find the smartest students and then bring them to China, uh, to Chengdu, in particular, into a boarding school. And we'll say she was one of those selected because she's one of the smartest. But then when she was 15, she was you know, she rode a train from Lhasa all the way to Chengdu with her father. But then from that point on, she enrolled in the school. And then she had to start to learn Chinese. And at the same time, she no longer got, she no longer got as much time to learn Tibetan any longer. So at the time she was 15, she was still growing up like a lot of you. But that's the, at that point, she has stopped learning Tibetan because at that school, the purpose of that school set up by China is not to you know, help her you know, uh, keep her heritage. Quite the opposite is to you know, uh, basically help um, to erase her heritage to the point that she you know, she has lost her Tibetan. And at the same time, she must learn to read and write in Chinese in order to, you know, um, stay in the school to perform well as a student. And then after that, she, sooner or later, she realized, oh Jesus, I can no longer write in Tibetan, but then now I have to write in Chinese. So it was, you know, um, in a way, then she has been able to reach more people. But then at the same time, she is very, it's very upsetting to her because Tibetan is her mother tongue. Her mother is 
Tibetan. Her father is half Tibetan. She identifies as a Tibetan, and yet, um, you know, she has to write in Chinese, which is not the language she prefers. But that's has that's what happened. Um, that was what happened under the education system um, in China, especially for the smartest students like herself, uh, the smartest non-Chinese students like herself. The goal of the government is to um, erase um, their heritage. So I have to say, you know, I know maybe, you know, it's Sunday you want to be out, outside to play, but it's important what you, what all of you are doing here, taking the time to learn the language and to embrace your heritage and to, you know, uh, basically to understand where your ancestors came from and to maintain that lineage of tradition and heritage. So I also would like to share with you something that, you know, we'll say has written about students, about Tibetan students. Again, like, you know, your age, uh, the struggle in Tibet, because as I can imagine, a lot of you have read and have heard in the news that um, things are very tough in Tibet for the Tibetans. So I have a piece I want to share with you. And then after that, I want to hear your questions and your thoughts, because that's what I'm here to do. I have actually been all over the US and Europe to meet with a, um, a number of Tibetan communities to share the work of Wose with uh, all the Tibetans who cannot travel to Tibet. And at the same time, she's also not allowed, Wose is not allowed to travel outside China um, because otherwise she would have gone all over the world because she is well known in many parts of Europe and in this country. Um, okay, and with that, I have a short piece to share with you about, again, about why it's important we're here today, you know, to learn Tibetan. Um, uh, this piece is called Scrapping Tibetan Lessons for Stability, meaning um, the Chinese government, in order to maintain what they call stability, they sacrifice um, the, um, the opportunities to learn Tibetan for a lot of students. Um, I still remember on October 19th, 2010, thousands of middle and high school students in Ragan of Amdo raised small blackboards with their demand, chalked in Tibetan, which says, we need Tibetan classes. This demonstration to defend the mother tongue was soon joined by countless school children across Amdo and other Tibetan regions in Qinghai and Gansu provinces. Even many Tibetan students in Beijing in Central University for Nationalities made the same appeal. I still remember more than 300 Tibetan teachers sent a joint letter to Qinghai's provincial committee demanding that Tibetan students be primarily taught in their mother tongue. The teachers opposed the quote unquote, mostly Chinese supplemented with Tibetan curriculum and its expansion into kindergarten. Retired cadres and veteran educators in Tibet also submitted opinions to the Education and United Front Ministries in support of this demand. Still, I remember the party secretary of Qinghai later recommended that bilingual education reforms be strategically and gradually adopted. The words certainly aim to appease Innocent Tibetans trusted that officials would keep their word and never thought this was merely a stalling tactic. In less than a year and a half, 
the other shoe dropped. In March of 2012, fresh into a new semester, school children in Tibetan and ethnic schools in Qinghai and Gansu provinces discovered that suddenly Tibetan learning materials had been replaced with Chinese language textbooks. In other words, the rug of bilingual education had been pulled from under Tibetan students. Just imagine what impact it had on the children of Tibetan farmers and herdsmen. Then on March 3rd, 2012, Serene Ki, a ninth grader from Machu in Amdo, set herself on fire in protest. And then on March 14th, thousands of students from high schools and teachers' colleges across Amdo took to the street to voice the demands for linguistic equality, national equality, and local autonomy. The reason why Tibetan education had landed on the chopping block time and again um, is more than cultural. It is political. It is political as evidenced by a document outlining education reforms in Qinghai province is um, it calls for implementing Chinese language education, uh, which is deemed a major political task in that document um, in the Tibetan regions. So concluded the officials in the wake of the 2008 uprising. Exterminating Tibetan language education will be crucial to maintaining harmony and political stability. Well, maintaining stability is as much about keeping the political situation calm as about winning over the hearts and minds of the public. A teacher from Amdo wrote this online. If we cannot even win over the hearts and minds of our children, just how can we maintain stability in the Tibetan region? Centuries ago, the Spanish conquistadors <laughs> occupied the Mayan land and wiped out the Mayan language off the face of the earth. Decades ago, the Cultural Revolution sought to eradicate Tibetan language teaching, so a whole generation of Tibetans, like me, like we'll say, had lost our native language. This time, though, it will be quite different. As 19-year-old Ki, who died from self-immolation, has shown, lives in defense of the Tibetan tongue will not be extinguished. So here we go with a 19-year-old student who had to set herself on fire to demand you know, the opportunity to be taught Tibetan. So then, once again, how lucky you guys are, you know, to have this cultural center every Sunday, you are surrounded by your community elders, and you learn Tibetan, I understand dancing is very popular now, you have the circle dance, so you have both, you know, lessons and also you have dance, so, so yeah, so I hope, you know, um, she, you know, uh, can get the message across that, you know, every Sunday morning is a, is a precious moment for all of you to, you know, discover your heritage and to maintain it. And with that, I would like to hear from, you know, from you. Yeah, yes. Oh, yes, very much. She's, uh, she's working hard. I have to say, I even though She's not um, allowed to travel outside China because in 2003 she sued the government. She said, "Hey, I need my, I need my passport, you know, because I'm sure a lot of you, you know, as American citizens or as citizens of any country, you you get a passport, right? You don't have to sue your government to get your passport." She she sued the government, and of course you never win when you sue the government in China. So she lost. She not. She's not allowed to have a passport. So therefore, she's never been allowed to 
to travel. Um, but then that means she has a lot of time to stay at home to to work. So um, she writes. She also writes poems. And right now she's been working on a a family story to uh, talk about the generations of her Tibetan family and what they have, what her family members have gone through. Uh, but whereas her husband has been allowed to travel because he's Han Chinese, so he has been um, going around the world um, to spread the message because he has also learned a lot about Tibetan culture and the people from his wife. But you know, it just goes to show so unfair. You know, if you're Tibetan, you're a famous Tibetan writer, you can, are not allowed to have a passport. Yeah, but then uh, the Chinese husband is allowed to have a passport and to travel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How old is your niece? Yeah, she is born. She was born in uh, 1966. Uh, that is, uh, I think that was the first year. Um, that was when the Cultural Revolution started. And what that means is that was the year when China was, uh, you know, was thrown into turmoil. Yeah, how old is she right now? Oh, so, well, you can do the math. I'm sure you learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You tell me. Yeah. I, yeah. Her mother. Yes. Uh, Yes, I yes, I met her mother because I went to Lhasa once in 2014 and uh, um, I stayed with her mother and we'll say, but sadly her mother passed away, um, I think it was last year. Um, but here's the thing too, and it goes to show how, um, how strict the policy is. You think, you know, you should be allowed to visit your mother, right? Um, say you live in Beijing. For example, you live in Chicago. Your mother is here in Madison. You should be, you should, you should be free to visit, you know, from, go from Chicago to Madison to visit your mother. But not for Wu Sei. When her mother was still living, every time she wanted to go from Beijing to Lhasa, she had to go to police to apply for permission. Isn't that funny? That's ridiculous, right? But that's the, that was the reality. So um, with the mother, you know, passing last year, now I'm not sure if she could get the permission to visit uh, Lhasa. And if she doesn't, that would be really sad. I mean, imagine the police said, oh, you cannot come back to Madison ever, right? So yeah, so I have to find out from her, but her mother uh, was living until last year and then she passed away. Okay, so yeah. Violet, yeah. can I make a quick yes, announcement? Yeah. So I would like to give the opportunity to the students first to ask questions. So any questions regarding Wasilla and also any questions, you know, about what's happening in Tibet right now. So prepare your questions. And then when the students run out of questions, then of course it's open to the public. Go ahead, uh, Ashish. Is she a grandma? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> because uh, um, she's uh, she's a writer. She's been very busy, you know, writing about Tibet. Um, therefore, she has not had um, a opportunity to have a child, and then her children, um, met metaphorically, are her books, uh, her many books and her poems. So no, she is not a grandma, and she won't be. <laughs> um, well, to be a grandma, you have to have your, you know, own children first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Good job. Oh yeah. Well, after she um, graduated from um, college in um, in Chengdu, then she went back to Lhasa to take up a job to um, at the Chinese language. Remember, she um, she wasn't allowed to learn Tibetan anymore. So then she learned Chinese. So she 
worked as, as uh, Chinese language um, magazines in Lhasa. And then, um, but then she got fired after she wrote a piece about the Dalai Lama that was published in China. Well, believe it or not, at the time, this was um, two early 2000s. It was published um, in Southern China because the editor of that magazine was quite ignorant. Um, the editor didn't know who the Dalai Lama is, and so the piece was published. But then when the government learned about that, she was, she was fired. Then she uh, ran away because she was, you know, in, she has, she has serious concern, she has serious concern about her personal safety. Then she went to Beijing, and that's how she, you know, got um, settled down in Beijing. Because in Beijing, there are a lot more uh, foreign diplomats, there are a lot more um, international attention should anything happen to her. So that's her calculation. But then it's also sad, right? Because imagine you had you had to run away to Chicago. You you're not allowed to like go you know stay in Madison, which is your land. Um, so that's the, her circumstance. But it's kind of um, for her own protection. But at the same time, she's um, has to distance herself from her homeland. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jail? Well, not yet. Uh, but well, we, we don't want that to happen. But then, again, if you're not allowed to travel outside China, uh, sometimes she's also not allowed to go out of her house, then, then her house is kind of turned into a jail in a way. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, there are times that she is not allowed to go meet say foreign diplomats, like foreign <laughs> officials who wanted to talk to her, because they all want to talk to her. Um, yeah, so the police would come to the doors and say, oh, you, you're not going out today, you have to stay home. Yeah. Yes. Not, well, because um, in China, you, know, you must have read about a lot of writers um, always in danger because um, because the government doesn't like what they write and they refuse to write things that would make the government happy because they see that it's their job to tell the truth, not propaganda. So um, so that's always the the the, the, uh, the not I wouldn't say fear the, the concern. Um, I understand that, for example, her husband, who's, who has also been writing about Tibet and also Xinjiang, you know, the Uyghurs who are, you know, who have been sent to concentration camps. I understand he has packed up, like, um, um, his clothing, some toiletries, just in case, you know, if uh, the government comes to him and say, "Oh, you have to," you know, we are taking. We're taking you away, so yeah, they are they're prepared. So that's the that's the um, circumstances there, and uh, it's not uh, they're not unique to them, but to a lot of writers and truth tellers in in China. Yes, you, yeah. You put your hand up, right? Um, not necessarily, but they only target certain people, like the famous people. Yeah, and also the non-Chinese, yeah, but she's Tibetan, right? And so, say she wants to go to, go home to Lhasa, then she, she has to ask the police for permission. <coughs> um, not, not so much. Yeah, so that's why it's unfair, right? Because how come... How come she's not treated like everybody else? Yeah. Yes. Um, is her husband like traveling around? How is he? I'm sorry. If her husband. Isn't he like traveling around, right? Um, um, Mr. Wang, um, he's, he's, 
he has been allowed to travel, but then, um, but in in recent years, I recall um, that would be several years ago. He was invited to speak in Russia, uh, in the ethnic region, I understand southern part of Russia. Then the day of his departure, he was about to leave home to catch a flight. Then the police visited them and said, oh, you're not going to the airport today or ever. We canceled the trip for you. Um, again, like the, the government you know, decided, oh, he shouldn't be allowed to speak uh, because he was invited there to speak about, of course, the ethnic minorities in China mostly. He, you know, the ones that he knows the best would be the Tibetans and the Uyghurs. So again, the government, I don't know, I don't understand what the government had, had to fear, but he, his trip was canceled. So since then, I understand he also hasn't been able to travel much at all. This, it used to be, at least he, he has a passport, he's issued a passport, he was able to travel theoretically, but in recent years, he's also not, uh, not allowed to travel as much. Yeah, and that, that canceled trip was the last one I recall. Um, that he actually wrote about in the, in the um, Washington Post, I understand. Yes. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll say his father died pretty early. He was um, a lieutenant in the People's um, Liberation Army. And um, so he, yeah, he died when we'll say was young. Um, I'm trying to recall. Um, in her 20s. Uh, but then he left behind a trove, a lot of photographs because he uh, he likes to he likes to take pictures, and he took photographs of what happened. Remember, we just talked. I just mentioned the Cultural Revolution, the um, 10 years of total chaos, um, and he took a lot of photos of how Tibetans were oppressed during that time. And then he put away the photographs. But then we'll say found that collection of photographs and published a book uh, a few years ago showing uh, those are all black and white photos. You know, back then there's no color, uh, no color uh, photography. So she showed how um, her father, um, even though he was in position with the government, with the army, he showed his care for his fellow people, the Tibetans. But just that he couldn't make it public while he was alive. But then, uh, you know, his daughter made it public in a book uh, published a few years ago. And uh, of course it was, um, translate that she wrote the descriptions of the photos, right? Because you have to explain to people what the photographs are showing. And then the explanations were translated into English. Hello? Yes. Yeah, what's your, what's your question? How old is Who's, who's <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. How old is she? doesn't have a son, though. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess, yeah, we'll open uh, the floor for the public to ask questions. Yeah, go ahead, so um, you talked about how like in like those certain regions of like um, China where like the Tibetan is like not like taught like supplementary and like it's mainly taught in like um, I'm assuming like Mandarin. Do you think there's like a way for Tibetan students who are in those schools to like make use of the Mandarin to like or make use of their Chinese to like speak out about these issues? Uh, that's a very good point. And so, um, so in her case, right? Of course, it's. Uh, it's a huge regret on her part that she wasn't able to master Tibetan because she remember so after 15 she went off to boarding school uh, in great excitement because she could get away from home 
But then she didn't realize at the same time she's also getting, you know, being pulled away from her heritage, from Tibetan learning. Then she started learning Chinese. But then as a result, she has been able to write about all, you know, everything that's going on in Tibet in Chinese. And her books were published in Taiwan. And by uh, statistically speaking, there are a lot more people can read Chinese in Tibetan because Tibetan is very difficult to learn. So meaning as a result, there are a lot more readers who could read about what's happening in Tibet thanks to her writing in Chinese. Yeah. So yeah, so in a way, uh, although it's not her choice uh, that Chinese learning was forced upon her, but then she was able to use that as a um, tool, if you will, to get um, the message across to many, many, many more people, including to me, because, you know, unlike you guys, I don't, I don't read Tibetan, but I read Chinese, so I was able to translate her writings into English, then more, then many, many, many more people can uh, read uh, about Tibet. sword so that's why it's important that a lot of all of you are here every Sunday to learn um, and of course to learn to write and to express yourself so, so that may be like I I wouldn't say advice but like kind of speaking from my own experience hello my second question is you know, how long have you known Osela? And you know, out of all the actors, writers you could be following, right? why did you decide to follow Osela? Oh, great question. So yeah, um, I um, let's see. So I started as a writer. I I grew up bilingually in British Hong Kong. So, but I never thought translating would be interesting. And in in fact, I thought oh, it's so boring. I rather write in my own words rather than translating someone else's words. But then um, around two, 2008, um, during the first, um, after the first Beijing Olympics, then I discovered uh, the work of um, a doctor. She recently passed away. She passed away last December in exile in New York City. Her name is Dr. Gao. She's single-handedly exposed the AIDS epidemic in China. Uh, because in China, the epidemic, uh, the HIV um, was transmitted through blood trade. Like poor farmers were encouraged to sell their blood. But then, uh, but then the needles that were used were um, contaminated. So they, a lot of them, they, they got infected. So she is so brave. She was in her 70s at the time. She's, retired but she cared for these you know poor sick people then discovered that oh that's a bigger issue and the government was behind that then and i she was doing a book tour in hong kong she wrote about what happened then she said oh i would want to see my work translated into english so then when i read about that i said like, wait maybe i can do that i never translated before and remember i bought translated for it then I actually translated some of her um, um, writings uh, and it was published in a magazine. Then I realized, oh, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, not just fun, but also very meaningful. Because without, uh, being, without being translated, then their writings cannot be read by English, uh, you know, English language readers. Then I started looking around and then 
uh, someone told me about Wose. Then, um, then I looked up her, her books, and as a journalist, I could tell her uh, reportage, her, you know, um, on Tibet is very, very good, very factual, um, is really like telling you what's going on on the ground. And a lot of it was written um, during and after 2008, the uprising. Remember, she started as a poet. She thought she would just be a literary person. She didn't set out to be a journalist. But uh, because of the uprising, she, you know, she took it upon herself to um, write to write about um, the situation on the ground. Because a lot of people from the Tibetan region told her, "Hey, this is what's going on." And she has a pretty high stature for her to be in this position to spread the uh, to spread the message because at that time she's already quite established on the internet as a blogger. Uh, she's she's um she's she's quite she's an early adopter like we would say because she's um, one of the first people who has had a blog, especially um, as a Tibetan. Um, so so in, so that's how I found her, and then I went to see her at her house. Um, and we were introduced by a mutual friend who at the time was a photographer for the New York Times. He's a Chinese a self-taught photographer. And then um, like he was taking pictures for New York Times at the time, for actually for 10 years, until the New York Times, uh, until Beijing asked the New York Times to um, to get rid of this person because it's just too good. Uh, so, so that's how we got introduced by a mutual friend. Um, that photographer himself also published a lot of books that uh, China doesn't like. Actually, um, really hate hate it because last time he uh, was a arrested because of a book that he's about to publish. Yeah. So that's how how it all happened. Thank you. Yeah. I guess uh, I'm going to request our deputy president, Yadomala, uh, to please offer thanks, Kata. Thank you, Kata Tuwale. Madison, and I would like to interact with your community. And she reached out to us, and we are very happy and very thankful for your support. And uh, we are very uh, confident that our fight for our rights and freedom in Tibet will be 
you know, what's a full field in near future. And once again, thank you so much for supporting our uh, Resela in Tibet, in particular, and our human rights in Tibet. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Wally.